little cakes there. Uh, but uh, thanks for joining us here again, as Jonathan said, uh, oversee a great social media team here at Dallas College. I'll get into the members here that help make up our great team in just a second. But before we get into what we're really here to do, which is talk about mobile photography, I want to discuss a few things that we do on a strategy side here at Dallas College that have helped us find great success. And we focus on the three E's. What are those three E's? We put them in little buckets of called education, educating, entertaining, and engaging. We educate because, well, that's what we do, of course. Uh, it's we want to be thought leaders as Dallas College. We want to be someone that can entertain you at Dallas College. What that means to us is building community and staying trendy. And that 30, as I mentioned, is to engage. We want people to be proud of Dallas College. They want to we want them to feel like they're missing out if they're not here. If they see things on our social media channels visually or maybe just through a caption that makes them feel like this is a cool place to be and this is somewhere they should be. That's our goal. That's our strategy and our photography helps us make that happen. For social media, of course, we're on all the big platforms as you would expect Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube and TikTok. TikTok is our newest. We launched that in April. Obviously not so much a photography thing and a video aspect, but something that's very important to the college for us to promote ourselves. Just kind of a brief explanation to further everything about Dallas College. Since our team started in December, uh, we've kind of revamped how some things have operated and now we find the, those three E's helping us greatly. Here's just a quick rundown of, of things we like to showcase and engage, educate, entertain with our audience. We've seen great stats lately uh, since the team took over this year. We have great engagement. Here's some examples of just comments we see where we again show very authentic, organic uh, visual content and it helps people feel connected to the college and we believe that's been a big reason for our success. Here's the team. This is the four of us, the great crew that makes this happen, myself, David. Of course, we have what's really great about our team. We have three social media managers. We're overseeing seven campuses and of course that makes up Dallas College as a whole. But what I love about our team and what we put together was three individuals who could do very specific and unique things. Krista Crawford, she oversees our Facebook and she is a graphic designer by trade who has learned so much about social media and is just kind of like the fun bubbly personality that brings life to our accounts. Uh, Jessica Strada, she has been in social media for, for quite a while now. She has a great way to engage and educate our audience. She oversees our Instagram account mostly, um, but she's like our captain of, of caption writing. She could come up with just great engaging content very quickly. And Jake Wagner, he is also a part of the team. He oversees our Twitter and he is also our data guru. We look at so much data that showcases what works and what doesn't work. And we study that every month and a lot of times every week to literally review how can we continue to improve and get better. It's something we strive for on a constant basis. And again, photography is a big part of that because we have to study what visuals work and don't work. And that's something we'll get into more here in a moment. Uh, before we get into photography and everything that involves with, again, using your cell phones, is we have to embrace a mindset shift. I had this quote I found from photographer Carl Taylor. Uh, you know, on our team alone, we have two professional photographers, Jessica and Jake, do photography on the side. They are masters behind the camera, but just because you have the camera doesn't mean that you're an unbelievable photographer. You have to have the skills to make it happen. And now with everybody you know, holding their phone and having their phone to, to take photos on a dime, there are things you need to know that you could use on a skill set base that will help you promote your social media account and make the college grow and hopefully, you know, maybe you can educate, entertain and engage as well. So what we want to do is showcase how we make mobile photography a big part of our strategy. But before you go out and actually hit the hallways, hit the campus, you have to get some things in order inside the office. And I will go ahead and shift over to Krista Crawford, who will quickly explain some parts that we do before we go hit the campus. Hi there. Um, I know that many people find like when you're walking around campus with a big 
DSLR camera around your neck, people can find that really intimidating. So our talking around with our phones can make that a lot easier, a lot less intimidating to people. But it also means that we can sneak around and take pictures undetected sometimes. But we have to remember that we have to have a model release form on hand. So before you head out to the field, it's great to make a few copies of those. But if you forget, if you don't, or if you just don't want to have to walk around with that, you can also um, either take somebody with you. So you have kind of a, a wing person to handle the forms and tag team and work work with you as you go around taking pictures, or you can try to do it digitally and just attach the form to an email and then either hand your phone off to a student and let them fill in their email address and then send it to them so they can fill it out and send it back to you. Or you can just, you know, type in their e email address yourself and do it that way. But either way, one great advantage, although it's annoying to have to try to deal with the, the forms, it is great to have their contact information too for like an added bonus to be able to contact them later and follow up and say, hey, you know, we used the picture that we took of you and it's right over here on Facebook in this post, check yourself out. And then maybe they'll follow it, follow us, but then we may even be able to use them in the future as a model, which is really cool. Because sometimes it's hard to find people that are willing to do it. So it'd be really nice to be able to do that. But once you're armed with your forms and you're ready to hit campus and take some photos, you want to be able to take the perfect shot. So I'm going to hand it over to Jessica to help us learn how to do that. Hey everyone. Okay, so clearly you don't want to be this girl, right? She's not even looking at her phone. She's not even looking to see what she's taking a picture of. So obviously, like kind of Dave was saying this before, just because you have a good camera on your phone or you may have like a DSLR doesn't necessarily mean you may know how to operate what you have. Um, so there's going to be some things that we're going to talk about that's going to help just help you know how to use the equipment that you have. Um, you can go next. So yes, taking a good photo is much more than just pointing and shooting. Um, really big key thing is to be intentional with your photo taking. So you want to have a clear vision and purpose of what you want to take a photo of. So that may seem easier than what it sounds, right? But it really is important because if you don't know what you want to capture or if you don't even have kind of like a just general or basic idea of like, okay, this is what I want to take a picture of like a student reading a book in the library or something like that, right? If you don't know kind of like what you want that image to look like, it's not going to be too easy for you to go if you don't really already know what you're going to want to take a photo of. So be intentional, um, always have a vision and purpose in mind when taking photos. Next. Okay, so we're gonna go over some photo taking tips. Um, first, big important one, frame your shot. You've got to frame your shot. Um, another thing, another way that you can talk about framing is composition. So composition are how elements are arranged in your photograph. Um, so composition is a huge, huge factor in taking great photos. As you can see, obviously here on the right, um, these two images, clearly the one on the left is not a great frame shot. It's not because it's kind of lopsided. It looks like literally someone just was walking down and just snapped a photo of this guy just on his laptop, right? Um, so the one on the right hand side you can see is, on the right hand side is obviously way better framing. Um, he's sitting in the first third and we'll talk about like about that rule of thirds here in a second, um, but the framing is just way better. You have some nice open space on the right hand side to kind of like balance out where he's at. Um, so this is just like an, an idea of what framing could look like, what frame, what good framing is. Um, and obviously you can be creative and do what you need to do, but framing is obviously really, really important. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about like grid on your camera phone. So I'm sure you guys are probably familiar with like whenever you see like the grid on your phone. Um, sometimes like for some people, it may not show up on your phone. So it's really easy to have that show up. I think on iPhone, if you just go to camera and then you toggle the grid option, it already automatically can put the grid on your phone. And if you have an Android, um, I believe it's in your settings and you go to apps, and then select camera, and then you can select, it's uh, called select line. So that's basically the same thing for grid. Um, so that's a way that you can get the grid on your phone. Some people I know don't like that if they don't wanna see the grid, but for others, it may be really helpful to make sure that your image is straight um, and that everything's kind of lined up and how you want it to be. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about rule of thirds. So um, rule of thirds is just a way to like help target the elements in your image, right? So kind of how I was saying before, this guy is sitting at that first third in this picture that has good framing, good composition. Um, you can honestly move your subject um, wherever you want in the third that you want to place a subject at. Um, it just kind of depends on you, uh, where you want to put it, where you, how creative, I guess you want to get to. Um, but just the main point about rule of thirds, having that as a guideline is just to have something in, in your third, right? You want to have something be the focal point of your image. A lot of times, like say you're at an event and you want to take a picture or something, what is, you know, if there's a lot of people in the room, maybe you want to focus on something to like take a photo of. So it's not just maybe like a big shot of people, right? You want to maybe focus on someone to be that focal point, to be that person who's in that third. Um, so yeah, let's move on. And we're going to uh, keep talking a little bit about framing. Um, let's see, we can go next. Okay, so we're talking about that focal point and autofocus tool is really important, right? So autofocus, a lot of people when they use their camera phone, sometimes they don't even like tap to see like what's in focus on the picture because sometimes it automatically will like focus in on something, right? Um, but little do you know if you didn't know this already you can click like tap on your phone and adjust where you want your autofocus to be so if you're taking a picture like let's just say i'm going to take a picture of david right if the autofocus is somewhere that's not on david's face it's going to focus in like and maybe let's just say like that banner that he has in the background and I want it to be focused on him instead you can just move like just tap where the autofocus tool is at tap on it and then whatever you want to be in focus should come to focus at that point okay next um refrain from zooming in just just don't do it because um it can really distort the quality of your image um especially like on a phone obviously whenever you're working with a DSLR if you have a zoom lens it should be able to like still produce like great quality images, but on your phone, it really can distort the, the quality of your image if you like zoom in on your camera. So just try not to do it because it really will not be a good, good thing for you. Um, if you need to zoom in, just simply um, get closer to your subject or to whoever you want to take a photo of. Um, and also you can actually, I know for sure on iPhone, there's an option where you can tap on the, I believe it's at the bottom middle um, part on your camera there's a button that you can tap and it'll literally go from like one X or go to like 0.5 X. And this basically just kind of like zooms in and out for you. You don't have to move. You don't have to like go in and squeeze the image to try to get closer. You can just automatically click that button. So on the right hand side here, you can see a good example of that. So like here, if the camera is at a one X, you know, it's like a pretty like decent shot, right? But if you zoom out a little bit, it just looks more dynamic, right? Like the image just looks way more dynamic. The buildings just stand a little bit taller. You can see more of the sky and just more of the elements in the shot. There's just a lot more vibrancy and color in there. So um, definitely utilize that tool if you're wanting to kind of have a more um, just dynamic shot. And get creative with your angles, right? You know, um, there's really no wrong way to be creative. Like creativity, like expand, expands like so much, right? So get creative with your shots. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Okay, next big thing with photo taking, lighting. Lighting is the second most important thing. So you've got composition slash framing, you know, same thing, but you've got lighting. And as the song goes, right, Ebony and Ivory living in perfect harmony, so do lighting and composition. You really can't have one without the other for a good quality image. Let um, me go next. So your light source can really determine the resolution quality of your image. And this may seem like a, well, duh, right? But it really, really has a major impact. So especially when you're using a phone, um, you want to get where there where there's good light. So most of the time for us, like on our team, we try to stick outdoors as much as we can. Or if we're indoors, just making sure that there's a lot of good natural light. You know, some place that has like a lot of windows could be a good a good light source for you. Um, maybe even just like a well lit like classroom or something like that. But the lighting has to be good. So if you're kind of in a 
place or a spot where the lighting is just kind of dark and it's very shadowy, it, it's probably going to look that way on your camera. So try to always have um, have a good light source if you're not outside. Um, and lighting and lighting can really truly make or break your image, right? So lighting also will could, can distort the quality of your image. So you always wonder probably like, why is that image so grainy, right? Well, an image is most likely probably grainy because there wasn't enough light in the picture. So the more light, the better. But obviously, you know, be careful with that because you don't want it to be too overexposed, too bright. Um, but yeah, okay, next. Okay, we'll talk a little bit more here about lighting. Um, so we're gonna talk about the auto exposure tool. So as you can see here, um, this is just an example showing you guys like how you can adjust the exposure on, on like, this is specific on an iPhone, uh, but it should be able to do the same thing on an Android. Um, so David, you can go next. Um, so here, this is the auto exposure tool. So if you click on like wherever you want to click on on the, your camera, you can slide that like where the sun button is at, you can slide it up and down to adjust the lighting. So say you're outside, you're wanting to take a picture, but it's like super overexposed, it's super bright. You can definitely adjust that just by clicking on the camera and then just going up for more light or if you want to like make it darker you just go down um so honestly like that, i remember telling my sister about this tool and she was like what i didn't know i could do that <laughs> and so it's really helpful because you can adjust like there's so much that you can do with a, with the uh, the cameras that we have on our phones right so that's just like one little tool that if you're in a low lighting uh, place you can bump up your exposure by just doing uh here what we have on the screen um so yes and then just and again kind of going back to being creative you know capture your images in various directions and angles um again there's like no wrong answer but obviously like you know for taste and for what people like it just kind of depends on what you're actually shooting but you know don't be afraid to get um creative with your shots and to try different angles and um i know for us we obviously always try i mean you'll see as we kind of go and go into our presentation we will get into all kinds of like situations just to try to get a good shot right um so don't be afraid to try different angles or to i mean i feel like sometimes maybe some people might be like oh i don't want to you know get attention from someone if i'm doing this but you got to do it for the gram right you got to do it for the shot <laughs> okay next Oh, and yes, flash. Use flash as a last resort option if you have low lighting, but try to refrain from it as much as you can, um, because once you have a flash in your photo, it can kind of just mess with the colors and just mess with all kinds of things. So just use flash as last resort if you absolutely have to, but if not, like go outside, go find another place where you could take the picture that has better lighting. Okay. trying to move on here okay so these are just gonna we're gonna just go over some of these last few um just photo taking tips before we dive into what jake's going to talk about next but first thing which kind of seems a little bit like trivial but clean your camera lens as much as you can when you're going to take a picture this sounds silly but like I mean, women, I know we probably toss in our phones around like all the time, put them in our bag. Guys, probably too, like putting in your pocket. So your, the camera is always getting like exposed to just everything. <laughs> so um, that could be a game changer if you're taking an image and you may, you know, if you clean your camera, you might be like, oh, wow, like my, my, the quality of this image just looks so much better. It's more clear or there's, you know, not little marks on it or anything like that because, well, the camera lens is clean. So try to clean your camera lens frequently. Um, portrait mode is great, but try to use it when it's appropriate. So I know when portrait mode obviously came out, everyone was like, oh my gosh, portrait mode, it's the most amazing thing ever. And it is, it is really great, but sometimes it doesn't work, especially if you're trying to capture an image and it's maybe like a tight shot where you're wanting to get closer in. Sometimes if you have a lot in the camera view, it's gonna probably focus on one little thing and then everything's gonna be blurred. However, there is a way that you can change the blurriness. Um, so we can talk about this more off, offline if you have any questions about this, but 
in portrait mode, there's a way that you can adjust the what's called the f stop number. And so f stop is just basically um, measuring like how much light is in your is in the camera. So you can actually adjust that. So then you don't have the image be super blurry with like the, the subject, like, you know, the subjects in focus and then the background, the background's really blurred. You can adjust the blurriness by doing that in portrait mode by adjusting the f stop number. Um, so again, if you have any more specific questions about that, like feel free to just like message us um, and we can definitely get you the answers to that. Cause I know that's getting a little bit too detailed. Some people are probably thinking like f stop, what you're talking like way too detailed here, but it really, you can adjust it. And again, you can do this all on your phone. So you see some images probably like online, you're probably thinking, man, that's a really great image. Did they take that with the DSLR? And it's like, oh wait, no, they actually took that with their phone. So you can get quality images that look really great. And portrait mode is one of those um, methods that you can do that. Um, let's talk about a little bit about um, activating the burst mode. So kind of like similar how I was talking about, you can um, toggle that grid option on your phone. You can also toggle the burst mode option, which so let's just say you're at a sports game or something where there's a lot of action. People are moving quickly. Um, if you activate burst mode, you literally will just be able to like click on the button to take a picture on your camera. If you just hold it down, it'll boom, 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 take a bunch of shots for you. And then later you can go back and actually select which one you want. But the good thing about it is it takes multiple images for you at one time just by one click of the button if you hold it down. Okay, next. All right, so as you can see here, yes, we will do anything for photos, right? <laughs> um, especially when it involves food. So again, just don't be uh, afraid to get creative. Have fun with it. I think in the end, if you're not having fun with taking photos, then you know what's the point? <laughs> and also, you're not going to enjoy the experience of taking photos. It, it seems like there's a lot, obviously, that goes into what we do right with taking photos, and there is. But over time, as you kind of just get a little bit more familiar with what your camera phone can do, um, the easier it's going to get and the more fun you'll have with it. And you'll be able to be like, oh, you know, what? let's try this. Let's do this. And oh, now I can do this. So let's, you know, just level up our images. Um, so last thing before we turn it over to Jake, um, try to not use the camera filters. Y'all know the camera filters that like come on your phone when you take a picture. Just try not to use those. And the only reason why, unless you're trying to be like super creative or artsy or something like that, um, just try not to use it because it really can just change how the photo looks for sometimes not for the better. Um, so save that filtering and the editing for Lightroom, which is an app that Jake's going to go into a little bit more detail about. And that's going to be a much better solution for editing an image than using a camera filter that's already on your phone. And now I'll hand it over to Jake. All right, thank you, Jessica. So I'm going to go over some information about Lightroom, which is a professional photo editing software that most people use on their computers. Pretty much every photographer has it on their computer. And it's, you know, the best you can get for photo editing, aside from Photoshop. And it is available on both Apple and Android. And to access it for Dallas College employees, I'm not sure if you, at other campuses, if you have access to Adobe. But if you do, you should be able to log in with your employee login if you have access to Adobe products on your computer. And the Lightroom camera is another tool you can use to uh, get the most detail out of your shots. It allows you to shoot in if you have a phone camera that allows you to shoot with raw, uh, like most iPhones do. I'm not sure about Android, but it lets you switch to DNG here instead of JPEG, which will give you more control in the editing. And I only do I don't do this that often, but if it's something that um, that I really have time to set up, then I might go for this option just to have that detail and have a more professional result. And then I'm going to walk through uh, how I'd edit a photo. So this one is one that I took a few weeks ago at our Eastfield campus. And you'll see I chose this photo because uh, you can go back, David. You don't have to play it yet. I chose this photo because it uh, you can see the student is kind of in the shadows. And that's kind of what I'm looking at when I'm editing photos for a college is I'm not really thinking about getting super uh, 
fancy or stylistic with the edits or trying to make it look like colorful or something unnatural that might work in a more artistic setting but for this setting i try to keep it keep the colors natural and just bring up the highlights and the bright and the shadows so that you can see the subject so this was a good example for that go ahead and go to the next slide and i have some bullet points here just for tips to remember when you are editing go ahead and play the video so i'm just going to show my process editing this so the first thing i'm going to do is bring up the exposure just to bring up the overall brightness and then i'm bringing down the contrast down the highlights and up on the shadows so you see that's giving me more light on the subject and giving me a little more dynamic range between the highlights and the shadows so that it's not so dark in the, in the front and bright in the back and i'm bringing up vibrance instead of saturation can you pause it real quick david just so i can have time to talk about that yeah so i, I like to bring up vibrance instead of saturation because saturation tends to change the colors and vibrance just brings up the colors that are already there so usually i won't even touch saturation most people don't know the difference between those two but that's a basic way to explain it uh, and i'll usually bring it up until it feels just bright enough to where it pops but not so bright that it's you know feeling unnatural i'm trying to stay in that that lane of natural let's go ahead and play it and the next thing i'm doing is the white balance i usually switch to auto and then i'll adjust from there so i see there's a little too much green so i'm going to add some magenta Hopefully you can keep up with all this. Uh, I wanted to be able to pause it, but we couldn't do that with the presentation. But if you have any questions, let me know. And go to the next slide. So you can see a before and after here. You might you might look at this photo when it's posted without seeing the first one and think, oh, they didn't edit that photo at all. Uh, just because there's nothing crazy about it, but you see these small adjustments and keeping it simple can really make a big difference. And then another thing that I uh, like to use and has saved my life on multiple occasions is the auto upright feature, which is a feature that Lightroom has on the desktop. That's a really advanced feature that is kind of new. And you can play the video, David. So you see this photo is a little bit crooked, but there are a lot of straight lines there. And that's kind of distracting. So I just went over to geometry and then upright and switched it to auto. And you can click that constrain crop. That was really quick. If you want to play the video again, David. So on the bottom, you have all those tabs. I'm going to geometry. And then upright, switching it from off to auto. And then it gives you those white bars where it rotated and adjusted the image. And you can click constrain crop. You can also do this just by rotating an image in the crop feature. But what this does is it also actually straightens lines within the image with the software and the AI or the robots inside your phone do it for you. So that's a great feature if you're just going around like running gun style taking photos and then you realize like, oh, that's not as straight as I thought it was. You can straighten it out like this. It's also really great when you're taking photos of the outside of a campus building. Uh, a lot of times it's really hard to get that straight, especially if you're down on the ground looking up. And that's kind of what this feature is built for is to straighten those perspectives. And you have all this on your phone. So now I'm going to show you how once you've made your edits, you can actually with the Lightroom app in the library where all of your edit, edited photos and photos will be, you can set it up to automatically import your uh, your camera, your phone camera's photo library. I don't do that. I like to just import them by myself. So I only have the photos I edited in Lightroom. And you'll see that blue icon on the bottom right. You can either take a photo or add a photo. So that's how I add my photos. And you see it's in a folder too. So you have organization within the Lightroom library. So go ahead and play that, David. I'm going to select the photo I edited earlier just by holding my finger on it. And I'm clicking copy. And then I'm going to select the photos that are similar to that photo. Again, I'm just tapping these with my finger. And I'm going to paste. And what that's going to do is paste all the settings and changes that I made on that photo earlier. So now all of the photos will be consistent. So 
So now I'll go into some of them and just look at a quick before and after by holding my finger down on the image. And I can see that it's doing what I wanted. We got an Instagram comment. Uh, and I can see that I'm good there. And usually I'll only do this for photos that are the same. I think that a lot of people that are new to photography will kind of, you know, get a preset set that they like on one image and then copy that to every image they make for the rest of their life. And I think that that can lead to uh, photos not looking as good as they could. So I try to always focus on one scene at a time. So like the scene with the student, I'll edit that copy it to all the photos of that student, and then do the same thing for the next one. Go to the next slide. So now exporting, this is a huge feature that the Lightroom app has, and it's one of the only reasons that I'm able to, I pretty much shoot everything with my social media job here on my phone, because I have this feature available to me. So go ahead and play the video, David. So I'm again selecting images, multiple images, the ones that I'm ready to upload to OneDrive. We use OneDrive on social media, but you can use you can do the same thing with whatever uh, cloud drive that you use. And if you follow the, I'm not going to go through the, the steps because I have them written out here, but you can see I'm changing the dimensions. I know I need them at 1200, let's say, on the long side. So I just do that and it's going to apply that to every single image that I selected. Then I click more options and I can change the name here. And this is really important because otherwise it's going to come in as like iOS underscore 32555, whatever. You can choose whatever name you want here and then you see start number and the example. That's how each file is going to be named wherever you decide to upload them. So I'm doing student outdoors because that's what these photos were. And then when I'm done with that, I go back and click the check mark. It's automatically going to render those and export them and prepare them for, for me to put wherever I want. So you see you can airdrop them, you can email them, you can put them on TikTok, Pinterest, Facebook, Outlook. We use OneDrive, like I said, so I'm going to do that. And then I can go to whatever folder I want and click upload here. And they'll upload automatically. They're done already. So just like that, we've gone. We've taken photos on our phone, we've edited the photos on our phone, we've exported the photos on our phone, and we never had to touch a computer at all. We could have done this all mobile in the moment. And then let's say uh, Krista or David or Jessica or me are back at, at a campus, we could take that photo and then upload it to social media or to the calendar or wherever we want to upload it. It's all really, really quick and easy. So to talk more about uh, naming the files and the best practices for that. I'm going to pass it back to Krista Crawford. Thanks, Jake. Well, I don't know if you all have experienced this before, but without some organization, you can feel like you have just this overwhelming mountain of files. So it takes so much longer to find anything that you're looking for when you have a million things all named like untitled and then various numbers after it or student 426 or whatever. So having something kind of more organized helps a whole lot. And it also helps a lot to kind of keep track of things from the beginning. So it, it organize as you go instead of waiting until you have like 3000 photos and then diving in and trying to keep it organized. So every time you go out to shoot, if you can then kind of get in a systematic, go through a systematic process to kind of organize the files and get them named and get them sorted at that moment it, it helps a whole lot i found that as a team we found that folders help a ton so it's great just to kind of group everything logically and to keep kind of general broad topics for the folder organization and we tend to name things things like that we use a lot and we, we know that we're going to need to find later like maybe campus beauty shots and some another folder for students or advising or whatever critical response or students in classrooms etc and uh, specific naming conventions can help a lot too so once you figure out good names for 
the general files and kind of going more specific for the file name, just like Jake talked about just a little bit ago, it helps a lot too. So if you can come up with something that tells you what it's a picture of, where you took it and when you took it, that helps a bunch. So you can just say something like, oh, this shot is a you know, preview day and it was taken at East Field. So maybe just like an EF and abbreviate that. And then the year like fall 2021. So when you go back to search for something later, if you're searching for you know something specifically from preview day, if if all your files were named student or untitled, it would be it would take you forever to find anything. But when you just type in preview day, I want I need specifically preview day shots from the Cedar Valley campus. So you can type that in and you'll pull up all the shots that were taken at Cedar Valley campus that day. That just saves you a whole bunch of time. So once you kind of get those things done and you've uh, uploaded your files and you got things organized the way you need them. Sometimes you realize that you might need to make a few more adjustments to the photos that are there. So you'll want to maybe change the dimensions. So you may end up getting a request like so you've already done stuff for social, but somebody from needs something for the newsletter, or needs something for the blog and you're like, oh, OK, well, I already took all these pictures and I have them sized for that, but I need a different size for a different platform. So based on whatever the request is, you'll have to let that kind of dictate what those dimensions will be and what that size needs to be. But if you've been mindful when you go out to take pictures of the sizing and you you keep in mind that to use your phone either in portrait mode, like straight up and down or to flip it on its side to take a landscape photo. And I tend to try to take multiple pictures of each just to get, give myself options later so you can have choices because sometimes it's easier if you're looking for a specific thing and you need to zero in on somebody's face or something. Having that landscape with a little bit more information on the sides can make it easier or it just depends on what you need, but having the options helps so you can have some wiggle room there. But um, let's see, it's also great to keep in mind like when you're saving and uploading your photos to OneDrive or wherever to save them out large to keep the file sizes if not as big as you can you know not not the smallest setting but at least larger so you have a little bit of wiggle room in that way too you can always make the image smaller but you can't make it bigger you can't make it bigger but you can't make it physically bigger i mean you can make it physically bigger i'm sorry make it physically bigger but you can't make the quality better so you want to make sure that it's big enough to be able to increase different areas like if you want to zoom in on something you want to have the data there to be able to do that and still have a quality photo so you want to save them big and then remember that you can always crop and adjust later to find something that works for a specific situation so that's pretty much it and um we know we covered a whole lot but i'll turn it back over to david to kind of wrap us up and to get to any questions that we might have well, thanks, y'all. Um, I know it was a lot of details, but we definitely wanted to hit every aspect of what goes into our strategy with taking photos on our mobile devices because it's such an important part. Um, we want to take any questions you have. If you want to direct them at anybody uh, specifically regarding content you saw. If uh, a private message is more your speed, I have our email address here that uh, is social team at dccd.edu. You can email us anything that uh, you want us to answer. But uh, totally open, open up to any questions that you might have. And I'll go ahead and answer the question we got from Ellen a moment ago. Uh, she said, are there other ways to upload to OneDrive other than Lightroom? So I showed you all how I upload from Lightroom. But if you have the OneDrive app downloaded, which I'd recommend if you do use OneDrive, uh, then you can just go into the OneDrive app, go to the folder you want to upload the photos to, and then there's an upload button. You click upload and choose the photos from your, your regular phone camera library. And it'll let you upload from there. And I will go ahead and put our email in the chat here too, just in case if you need to copy and paste it or keep it for later. Yeah, hopefully that hopefully you all find that very helpful. Um, again, what we do is a on our strategy outside of obviously focusing on mobile photography. There, there's as you can see, the math doesn't line up exactly perfectly. There's four of us and there's seven campuses, 
So we do have to uh, kind of strategically pick when and where because balancing the campuses we show and the student life on each campus is really important to us. So uh, as a team, we just rotate in visiting different campuses to kind of just bulk up our folders. And we, uh, speaking of all the organizing, we like to put everything into seasonal categories. So right now, obviously, kind of using a fall folder because in December, for example, uh, we don't want people in T-shirts and shorts on our uh, photos walking around campus because that would just show that we are not uh, you know, trendy visually, you know, so that that's something we focus on too that I, I wanted to mention. Nick. Yeah, I didn't have a question so much as an observation, and this is something that I try to stress with um, our our team is I noticed that for all the photo samples you had, I mean, you all had a lot of photos. And so I, that's why I try to tell folks is don't just go in and take one or two or three shots, go and take 20 because you you don't want to just pick from the few and just go with the best even though maybe none of them are really that good but you're going with the you know the best of the worst um but really just be intentional about it and take as many photos to find that one that you think will work so definitely and you know our social team we strive to make our director jill lane uh of social media and advertising a, a very happy and we know that a good balance of content is exactly what you know she's looking for and what our, our students are looking for. So it's something that we we harp on every week. And yeah, you're totally correct. I mean, we we even joke like we're going to burn through the images, but we try to set a schedule to just keep collecting. So we have no fear of, of really running out. It just keeps us motivated to, to keep growing that database because there's there's students there every day, so we have plenty of opportunities to keep adding. Great. Well, th David, thank you so much. I don't want to cut off any questions, so if anybody has any additional questions or thoughts, be sure to ask them in the chat or you can just speak up and raise your hand. So any last thoughts, comments, questions? I am going to share a just a quick survey in the chat as well. So if you can at least a answer the first question on that survey, that'd be great. Um, if you want to share some more details and so forth, then that's excellent as well. But before everybody wraps up, if y'all could just click that and uh, share your thoughts, we'd appreciate that so we can kind of know what to do for coming months. And I think that's probably it. Uh, again, really appreciate everybody joining us and uh, hope to have this probably every second Thursday of the month going forward. So. That's kind of what our goal is, and we'll see um, how it works out. But again, thank you all for participating. David, Jessica, Krista, Jake, thanks for presenting and, and sharing the great information with us. We really do appreciate it. This is what, in my mind, this is what makes TACM great. So thanks for doing that for us. Thank you, everyone. All right, y'all have a rest, a great rest of the afternoon.